at Mind and Life Europe. This is our penultimate uh, talk of the season of the Francisco and Friends series. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to Adam Engel, who is our special guest this evening, who will be in dialogue with Amy Cohen Varela. So I'd like to just briefly um, remind you a couple of things about this series and then also um, formally introduce Adam Engel before we give him and Amy the floor for this evening. So the Francisco and Friends series, as many of you know, uh, started in 2021, and it's part of Varela 2030, which was meant to honor the life and work of Francisco Varela through some of his closest relationships, both professional and personal. So this evening, Adam Engel, uh, who was the co-founder and leader of Mind and Life, will be speaking with Amy, and I'll briefly introduce, um, introduce Adam. So Adam Engel co-founded and led the Mind and Life Institute for 25 years as chair and CEO before retiring in 2012. Previously, and during the early phases of Mind and Life, he worked as an anti-war lawyer during the Vietnam War, was general counsel of GTE Iran in Tehran in the mid-1970s, and founded and led other business and nonprofit organizations, both in the United States and internationally. He holds a BA in economics from the University of Colorado, a JD from Harvard Law School, and an MBA from Stanford Graduate School of Business. And as many of you know, um, the title of the talk is The Secret Sauce of Mind and Life, The Entrepreneur, The Contemplative, and The Academic. And so we have one of those three pillars uh, with us this evening, Adam, the entrepreneur, who was really um, foundational in, in starting this venture and this adventure of, of mind and life. So thank you so much, Adam, for your time and for your sharing this evening. And the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for doing all of this. And thank you for Mind and Life Europe. Um, from my point of view, I'm just uh, overwhelmed with gratitude uh, with uh, just realizing how much, uh, how many people over the years have uh, been involved with the Mind and Life program and supported Mind and Life. And, you know, for someone who started an organization. Um, it's just amazing 35 years later that it's still up and running and thriving. So thank you all very, very much. Um, thank you, Adam, for being with us. And thank you all for coming on to hear us tonight. Um, yeah, let, let me just say a few words about the title. Um, it came up in kind of a pre-meeting that we had. Um, I just made a comment that from my point of view, the secret sauce of, uh, of Mind and Life was the uh, very, very rich and, and, and effective collaboration between three disciplines. Uh, the contemplative, um, you know, where the original partner and still main partner is the Dalai Lama, uh, the, the science where the original partner was Francisco and the entrepreneur where the original partner was me. And uh, just a comment that, uh, you know, from my point of view and my experience, um, without all three legs to that stool, it doesn't happen. And I just, um, a lot of, there's a lot of focus on the science and the contemplative, uh, but the entrepreneurial part is a very, very real piece of it all. So that's where the title comes from. Um, mm -hmm. Just as a reminder that uh, it's an important piece of the puzzle, was an important piece of the puzzle. So Amy, where, where would you like me to start this, this evening? Well, why don't you tell us about the puzzle and how pu puzzle piece entrepreneur met puzzle piece scientist, i.e. <laughs> you're, you're joining up with Francisco yeah. and, and, uh, and how, that, how that came together. Yeah, actually, maybe you can help me with that a little bit. So um, the, the actual seed thought for me uh, and what started it all for me was I was uh, attending a meeting, a uh, uh, original board meeting of the FPMT uh, organized Universal Education Association from Lama Yeshi. And someone in the room mentioned that the Dalai Lama wanted to meet with scientists and have discussions with scientists. And I thought to myself, wow, that's a pretty strange idea. I'd never heard that before. I wonder if it's true. Um, and uh, there was another fellow in the room, Michael Sotman, who knew the Dalai Lama personally. And I asked Michael afterwards uh, whether it was true. And he said, yeah, yeah, this place is really interested in science. So I said, well, you know, if he's really interested in this stuff, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to organize it, you know, and, and kind of 
uh, set that up for me. Um, and Michael said, well, if you want to do that, I'll, I'll help you. And so we started in, uh, this was in, uh, I believe, the summer of 1983. Um, and I was connected uh, and living in the Boulder Creek, California, and connected with Vajrapani. So we had a lot of um, people who knew the Dalai Lama come through, and I asked them, and they all said yes, he liked it. Um, fast forward to uh, the fall of 84. Uh, I was now enrolled in the Stanford Business School. His Holiness was coming to um, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, I believe it was in October. And Michael and I went down uh, to the teaching to see whether we could connect with His Holiness's entourage and offer uh, our, our, our offer to set up a science meeting. And I'll skip through, you know, the logistics of that, but we got authorization. And so then we started uh, figuring out what to do. And we had read uh, the uh, Tao of Physics and the author of that, Fritjof Capra, was living in Berkeley. And we uh, made contact with him and uh, had meeting a meeting or two with him, asking him whether he would like to, you know, join as our scientific partner and help us set up a, a meeting with the Dalai Lama. And he was, he was kind of lukewarm <clears throat> about it. He said, you know, I've done a lot of new agey things lately. And, um, um, and so he was lukewarm. And so we were kind of scratching our heads, figuring out what to do. And one day I was in my apartment uh, at Stanford and uh, the phone rang and I picked it up and the uh, voice on the other end said, oh, is this Adam Engel? And I said, yes. And he said, well, my name is Francisco Varela. I'm calling from Paris and I've heard that you are working on setting up a meeting with the Dalai Lama, a uh, science meeting with the Dalai Lama. And I said, yeah, that's true. And he said, well, what are you planning to do? And I told him about the conversations that we had had with uh, Fritjof and that we were going in the direction of physics. And he said to me, I remember he said, oh, Adam, Adam, he says, don't do physics. Physics is a dead science. Do biology, do cognitive science. <laughs> and it kind of like floored me. I, you know, I, I'm not even sure I'd heard the words cognitive science before, but, you know, I could figure out what it was. So I said, okay, well, um, convince me, you know, tell me why you think that. And he started talking and um, I started listening. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, wow, here I am. I'm trying to set up this science meeting. I got one scientist that I've been talking with who's lukewarm. And now here's this other guy who pops up out of the woodwork and he's really enthused. So let's, uh, let's listen and see where it goes. And so he kept on, um, you know, being very, very um, uh, persuasive and uh, very, very, uh, ingratiating the way that Francisco was. And I said, okay, well, let's continue this conversation. And, uh, and we, I'm not exactly sure how many other conversations we had, but uh, after, you know, enough of them, I said, well, you know, I've already told the private office that we're doing it on physics. So um, I'm headed to Switzerland this summer for a, a Kalachakra event. Um, and I'll meet with the people there at the private office, and I will ask them whether uh, it's permissible for them if we switch the subject to uh, cognitive science. And if so, then we'll work together. So, um, uh, you know, we continued to talk, and I went to Switzerland. I met with uh, His Holiness's secretary and the other people that were there, Bob Thurman, John Avedon, not His Holiness, Tenzin Chogyal, um, who was my primary contact. And the word came back, yeah, uh, you can go you can go in that direction. Uh, we've already met, His Holiness has already met Francisco. And, uh, you know, he's uh, happy to go in that direction. So I, um, uh, I got uh, back to the United States. And <clears throat> I think the next big thing was um, we're now in... Uh, 1985. Uh, and in the fall of 85, Joan Halifax, Francisco was scheduled to come to the Ojai Foundation, um, uh, you know, for an event that they were doing there. And, and it was, and part of that was Thich Nhat Hanh was doing a teaching. 
And so um, Joan uh, invited, uh, Joan Halifax invited us, invited me and Michael to come down and meet Francisco. And, uh, and I, we did, and uh, we had a really, really nice meeting and a strong connection and decided to work together. And we kind of penciled out an idea for a meeting that would, it was actually in concept similar to the public meetings that we wound up doing. And we thought uh, that, you know, Francisco thought that he could get a venue at Stanford. Uh, and uh, we targeted December of uh, 1986 as the date. And I started negotiating with um, the uh, private office or the New York office. And just before the, um, or before we got a letter authorizing it, um, that trip was canceled. His Holiness's trip to the United States was canceled. He was gonna go visit the Pope in Assisi. And then I also learned uh, that the uh, uh, private secretary had changed. Anyway, I'll skip through a lot of this stuff. People, if they're interested in the early history, they can look at my, uh, my video that I did for Mind and Life US where I go through a lot of that stuff. But the long and the short of it was that uh, in September, or no, in March, April of 1986, I had a spring break from uh, business school and I decided to go to Dharamsala to see whether I could get this back on, online. And I went to Dharamsala, I met with uh, Tenzin Geshe, the new secretary, and uh, he had heard nothing about this. Uh, and Tenzin Chogyal, uh, who did remember me, uh, got it back online. I had an audience with His Holiness to talk about it, and he was very, very enthusiastic. And I found out that he was uh, going to uh, Europe uh, in uh, you know, June, July, I'm not sure when. And so I, had, I arranged with a private office to, for him to have a uh, conversation, a private conversation with Francisco in Paris um, as a way of you know, moving the project along. And uh, that conversation happened. Francisco called me up and he said they had a very, very warm conversation. And uh, uh, Francisco said they had to almost drag his holiness out of the room. And in parting, his holiness said to Francisco, why don't you come to Dharamsala and let's continue this conversation? And I said, oh, that's really interesting. And Francisco said, by the way, it's really, really good that we didn't do what we were planning because um, his Holiness's uh, command of English is not that great, and his command of science is not get that great. So the idea of doing a, you know, private conversations uh, is a much better idea. And I suggested, well, what about taking a few more people and just rather than just you personally showing up, um, you know, we bring a few others. And he really loved that idea, and that was the seed for um, what we uh, eventually wound up doing. Uh, took me another trip to Dharamsala in the May, in, you know, the, uh, the fall, the spring of 1987 to actually meet with them again and get a date. And then uh, I got a date and uh, called up Francisco and we met in, uh, on the shores of Lake Geneva. I had some business in Geneva and Francisco came down. We spent, uh, two to four days, I can't remember, putting together the agenda and the um, invitation list and uh, put out the invitation list and started organizing plane tickets and um, uh, got our dates, uh, our first meeting set up for um, uh, the fall of 1987. Uh, and it was, uh, it was fantastic. Most of the uh, attendees were people that Francisco knew from... Um, his uh, uh, from from the uh, Shambhala community actually, um, Eleanor Roth, Newcomb Greenleaf, uh, Jeremy Hayward, um, and uh, and it was a really really great meeting. And afterwards, I turned to His Holiness and I said, "You want to do it again?" And he said, "Yes." And you know, it started forward. Um, the thing about 
Francisco in this process was that he was really, really clear about, I mean, Francisco, as, as everyone knows, and I'm sure everyone has said, uh, was really the embodiment of the, um, more than a conversation of, of the, uh, the dialogue, the, you know, the deep struggle or dialogue uh, between uh, the contemplative world and the science world. My understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Amy, is that uh, Francisco was actually led to the contemplative world uh, by, um, you know, through science and, and questions that popped up in his science investigation that science didn't have any answers for. <clears throat> um, that's the way that I remember it. And uh, he was a very, very ardent practitioner, um, left Chile, as people know, um, I think briefly uh, with a community of people moved to Costa Rica and then to Boulder. Uh, I didn't know him when he was in Boulder. Uh, and he, that he came here, uh, you know, to be with Trimpa Ripache, uh, and then eventually uh, moved on to Paris um, where he spent the remainder of his life in the science world. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the dialogues, uh, you know, he was the, uh, the, the way that I always saw it, saw it was, you know, I was a general coordinator. I took care of the material plane. Uh, I basically did everything that was necessary to get everyone in the room on time and on budget. And then once we got into the room, uh, it was Francisco, uh, at least in the early meetings, and, and after him, the scientific coordinator or the academic coordinator who took over and uh, coordinated everything that was happening in the room uh, and then also coordinated the uh, post publications. Um, and Francisco had done this enough. I remember him telling me that he had tried to have a science uh, Buddhism dialogue, I think at Naropa uh, in Colorado. And he said it was really a disaster and he had learned from that and he knew how to put, put it together so it would work. And a, and, a, and a big part of that was choosing the right people, the people who had, uh, in my words, not his, uh, uh, significant enough ego management to be able to listen rather than just talk. Um, and, um, and, 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 the, and the model was that the... Academics that we choose, and I say academics because not everyone was a scientist. Francisco actually insisted that we have a philosopher in the room because he thought it was part of, was a critical part of bridging, uh, you know, science and Buddhism uh, to, uh, to frame uh, what science was in terms of the philosophical underpinnings of uh, of, uh, of Western thought, really. Um, and uh, so Francisco was really the architect of um, how to set up these meetings, the curriculum of these meetings, so that they worked. And then the other thing that I saw happening was the personal connection between Francisco and His Holiness. Um, <clears throat> That was a very, very, very profound uh, connection, uh, such that whenever Francisco's name is now mentioned, uh, His Holiness, you know, shows a photograph uh, that he keeps on his altar of Francisco. I'm sure he's shown it, uh, and I saw, I saw when he was here, he showed it again. Um, and um, you know, as I reflect on <clears throat> the dialogues and you know the long history of of mind and life and the dialogues, I. I've never asked His Holiness this, but I, I, I suspect that um, it was the connection, the personal connection between him and Francisco originally that motivated him to want to do more. Um, and then that, and, and I saw as the dialogues evolved, there was usually one or two people during a dialogue that he connected with, and I would uh, follow up with them and uh, invite them to be on the advisory board. Um, and uh, clearly, you know, the relationship that he's got with Richie 
uh, is, um, uh, you know, is, is very, very uh, powerful and a uh, very, very strong personal connection. So let me stop rambling and uh, Amy, you can put me back on course for- It's uh, wonderful. Thank you so I, much. I, 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 um, I, have, I have a couple of photographs here. Uh, I didn't scan them and put them online, but I don't know whether you'll see them with the camera, uh, but these are from the early dialogues showing the connection between Francisco and his holiness. And here's one that I haven't looked at in a while, but in those early days, we didn't even have PowerPoint. You know, we had these, uh, these projectors that you lay something on and had a screen there so that um, we had that set up in the room. <laughs> uh, the technology. Uh, here's, uh, um, you know, Francisco and uh, His Holiness and, uh, and Tupta Jimpa. Uh, Looking very young. Yeah, <laughs> like us all. Um, <laughs> And here's another one where they were examining something. Uh, I'm not exactly can't see it very clearly. May have been I think a model it was a the, model, a model a of mo the brain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, it's uh, you know, Francisco didn't really, uh, I, you know, I think how many how many dialogues have there been? You know, 25, 30, 35, something like that. Francisco only participated live in four, um, and he only uh, coordinated two. But his influence pervaded and still pervades uh, the very, very DNA of mind and life. Because more than anyone that I've ever met, Francisco really embodied this, uh, this well, let me say it a little bit differently. What we understood was that Science, um, the goal of science is to, uh, the goal of both science and Buddhism is to investigate the nature of reality and to use that investigation to create uh, tools and practices that will help people in their lives. Uh, and but the the method of investigation is different. Uh, the contemplative world, Buddhism, uses the human mind refined through meditation as its instrument of investigation, and the science world uses uh, technology um, and quote objective means to investigate. And so the whole uh, exercise was to create a forum for these two paradigms to collaborate and share their findings um, with the hope and expectation that it would benefit both. And <clears throat> Francisco actually embodied that. Um, he was an ardent practitioner. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure people have talked about the fact that he, um, you know, went to, uh, well, even before, or I guess during, uh, from the time he met Tulka Urgen Rinpoche, he, he spent uh, some months a year in uh, Kathmandu. Uh, Francisco, um, outside of mind and life, um, traveled to Colorado uh, regularly after, uh, even before we met, but after we met, uh, and for the meeting in Crestone for the Lindisfarne Foundation. Uh, and I'm sure people have talked about that, Bill, uh, William Irwin Thompson. Uh, and his son, Evan, uh, who is a protege of Francisco. And uh, I would pick Francisco up at the airport and uh, we'd spend some time here in Boulder and then drive down to Crestone and spend those days in Crestone and then come back. And so uh, a lot of our personal time was actually spent in that. Uh, Francisco arranged for me and uh, uh, to visit Tulka Ergen while he was living at Nagigampa. Um, and Francisco and Danny Goldman, um, uh, well, through through my relationship with friend, uh, uh, Tuko Ergen Rinpoche, I started studying with Sony Rinpoche when he was just coming to the United States in the mid nineties. Uh, and we've remained friends and, uh, and uh, he's my te primary teacher now. Um, and uh, Francisco had arranged for me to go to Nagi Gapa. Uh, so that was another, um, you know, very, very important 
venue and opportunity for us to connect. Uh, so it was much more than than what we were doing in mind and life. It was really uh, fellow travelers on the Buddhist path. Um, Amy, you want to get prompt me for something? Getting back to getting back to um, talking about the establishment of mind and life, I'm thinking that this wonderful story you told about connecting with the, connecting the idea of getting science together with His Holiness with His Holiness in in, in a in a conference contact and context and um, and uh, and getting in contact with him. It suddenly became quite a bit harder, didn't it, in 89 after the Dalai Lama got the Nobel Prize. And I was thinking about wondering if that changed things for you as, as an organizer and as the leader, of my, the leader of Mind and Life Institute, that shift. Because I heard, I think we've all heard that it was announced during a meeting in California to his holiness <laughs> that he got that. Do you remember that story? Yeah, yeah. Um... The second meeting of mine, well, let me, let me preface it by saying one of the things that happened in the first meeting, and I believe it was Eleanor Roche who was presenting to His Holiness, and she was laying out a, uh, uh, a lineage of experiments that uh, they, they were doing. Um, and she started talking about it, and His Holiness interrupted, and he said, well, what about, um, and Eleanor was kind of taken back and you know, stunned. And then she recovered and she looked at his holiness and she said, your holiness, you would make an excellent scientist because that's what we thought of next. And I looked at that and I thought, hmm, you know, I wonder what would happen if we could get his holiness into a laboratory with the laboratory people around the table and they could show him you know, the tools that they were using and the problems that they were they were grappling with. And maybe, you know, that dialogue would have some breakthrough. Um, and uh, so I, I asked Robert Livingston, Bob Livingston, who attended uh, the first meeting, where, well, no, what happened was I, re I, I found out that His Holiness was going to be in Southern California, in San Diego area. Um, for almost a week doing this conference, Harmonium Mundi, because the organizer of that uh, had come to me uh, to try and or help, help him organize it because he had this idea and I had done a successful meeting. And I remember him calling me up and you know, he said, how did you do that? How do I get his holiness to do stuff? And I said to him, you're not going to like the answer, Ron. His name was Ron Jew. I said, but the only way that you're going to be able to get through to these guys is if you go to Dharamsala and actually sit there face to face with them. You know, trying to do this through facts and letters is not going to make it. I had to do it twice in order to get this meeting going. So he did it and um, and he set it up and his holiness was going to be in California. And when I looked at the schedule, there were Two days, I think it was going to be there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And on Thursday and Friday, he only had evening activities. And so the days were free. So I got a hold of the private office and I said, can we use those days for a mind and life meeting? And I was thinking that we could, you know, have a laboratory-based meeting there. Um, as it turned out, it wasn't a laboratory-based meeting. It was a meeting that uh, took place in the home that His Holiness was staying in. And, but we had it all organized. And then uh, my recollection is that um, the morning of the meeting, the Thursday morning at roughly three o'clock, uh, the phone rang in my, in my hotel room and uh, someone, and I don't know who, who it was, uh, what I remember is they, I picked up the phone and they said, have you heard? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, they just announced in Oslo that His Holiness has been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And the Norwegian ambassador is actually here in Laguna Beach, waiting for His Holiness to wake up, to meet with him, to um, tell him and present, you know, this, not the award, but whatever they do. And so is the meeting gonna happen? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> 
But the meeting did happen. His Holiness met. Um, and uh, the amazing thing was that uh, he wouldn't he wouldn't take time away. Well, I think he took an hour or two to have a press conference. And then he he insisted that he continue with the dialogue um, over those days. He, he did other things around, um, you know, oh, I remember um, they wanted to do, uh, I think a, a, um, ABC wanted to do an evening live broadcast with him. And they, uh, the private office said, no, um, you know, he can't travel. And I said, well, he doesn't have to travel. They'll set it up wherever he is. They said, oh, they can do that? <laughs> uh, and, and so, yeah. So anyway, getting to your question, was it harder to organize? Um, you know, in a way it was, but not really. Um, the difficult, the, 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 a piece of the puzzle that is heavily underappreciated is the uh, influence of uh, Nari Rinpoche, Tenzin Shogel, in uh, having these dialogues come to life and keeping them on track. Um, the only way to really formally get through to His Holiness is through the private office. And the private office's job is to, one, you know, primary job is to uh, take His Holiness's time, which is very, very finite, and interface that with the infinite level of demand on his time. And um, the private secretary, Tenzin Geshe, um, was not a fan of mind and life at all, because it sucked up so much of His Holiness's time. I mean, His Holiness didn't do anything for a week other than teach Buddhism, ever, is what they told me. And so he was always dragging his feet on meeting dates. But the good, the you know, the other thing about Tenzin Geshe was that he was incredibly loyal to His Holiness and shared everything, you know, and made his, had His Holiness be the final decision maker. And His Holiness kept on saying, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the reason was because the only way into His Holiness, other than the private office, was through Tenzin Chogo. Because he went up every day and hung out with His Holiness. And they had lunch his together. His little brother, right? His little yeah, brother. His little brother. So right. I had a direct link to Ten Tenzin Chogo. So whenever I wanted to do something with His Holiness, I would call him up. And we would talk about it and make, make you know, bat it around and stuff like that. He'd get clear in his mind. And then he'd trot up the hill and have lunch with his holiness and say, this is what these guys want to do. And his holiness says, yeah, great. That sounds great. And he'd tell Tenzin Geshe. And then Tenzin Geshe would, you know, drag his feet, but we would finally get the dates. So um, it was, that's kind of the way it all worked. Uh, you know, and, and I asked his holiness at one time, what, what the Nobel Prize meant to him. And he said, you know, it made a lot of the people around me really happy. So I'm happy for them. Uh, it's, uh, it's given me access in different ways, you know, so that I can uh, promote the Tibetan agenda. Uh, you know, but, you know, for him, it was just another day. <laughs> I mean, if, if you, you know, if, if you go to if you go to Dharamsala now, uh, the room that I think it's true, the room that we had the original meeting in is no, the the room that we had the original meeting in is now His Holiness's audience room. The ante room to that uh, is just filled with awards. Um, you know, plaques on the wall with awards. Um, and so from His Holiness's point of view, it's just it's just another thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, Adam, thank you. Speaking of um, promoting agendas, in one of the talks that I heard you give, in, I think in the context of Mind and Life Institute, you said that the the 2000 meeting, and this was actually the last meeting where Francisco was present, 
um, was a turning point for Mind and Life. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it actually goes back uh, to 1998. Um, by the way, before I do that, I, I want to, I, I just thought of another another vignette, so to speak. Um, and you can help me with this, Amy, if I've got the dates wrong. Um, yeah, I think it was 1998. That was the year that Francisco had the heart operation, right? Or, or the liver transplant. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. Right. So um, that was also the year that we were doing the two-day mind and life meeting in Innsbruck. And we, um, in order to make that happen, we had to pick up, we had to charter a plane and pick up His Holiness in Paris. He was finishing up in Paris and then fly him down to Innsbruck for a couple of days and then fly him up to Helsinki, I think. Um, and Barry Hershey funded all of that. And my recollection is that when we landed in Paris, I called you, Amy, because that was the time that he was actually in surgery. Yeah. Do, do you remember that? I do remember that, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, I think he had just come out of surgery, and he was in that, the surgery was successful, but he was in that touch-and-go time, yeah. which I learned afterwards was really, really harrowing because they had to get the chemical cocktails right. Uh, right so that um, the liver wouldn't be rejected, but that the right. chemicals weren't po so powerful they killed them. Is that? That's exactly that, right. That's yeah. a, it was a cortisol cocktail. Yeah. Right. And, and I remember His Holiness, you know, the limousine came up to the tarmac where we had the plane and His Holiness got off and I met him in the limousine and I, uh, and I said to him, I said, Francisco just came out of surgery. Um, and he's in recovery right now. And his holiness stopped. We were actually, you know, right at the steps. And he stopped at the, at the stairs of the, at the airplane. And he just kind of like went, went into himself, you know, for 30 or 45 seconds. Um, and then he came up and he got on the airplane. Uh, and, you know, I'm assuming that he was, you know, sending out prayers you know, for, for Francisco. And it's poignant that that was the time that Francisco was in that very, very um, critical time. It was a very critical time, a very samsara-like time as well, since all those yeah. drugs made him yeah. hallucinate and made him very sick. But anyway, getting back to your question, what, what was going on um, in around 1997 was that... Um, uh, okay. um, 1997 was that um, when, the, when the dialogue started, I, you know, my motivation was to gift them to his holiness. And I only thought it would be one. By 1997, I think we were up to our sixth dialogue. And I was getting um, uncomfortable because um, I was concerned that we weren't maximizing, His Holiness was engaged, and I was concerned that we weren't maximizing the societal benefit of these interchanges by just having, you know, a half a dozen people come to Dharamsala uh, every other year and publishing a book, um, you know, uh, three to five years later. And so I... Um, I actually convened a meeting of the um, advisory committee um, in the fall of 1998. So Francisco had that operation in, what was it, April, Amy? March, June. April? June. In June. Oh, okay. So it was June. But by October, he was well enough to come to Cambridge. Yes. Yes. So he had, he had recovered quite well. Mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. he was really up to speed when he got to Cambridge. Ah, up um, to speed. <laughs> well, I, I mean, you know, at least, yeah. you know, he was fully participating. Mm -hmm. 
And um, yeah, I remember us walking around and because uh, it turned out that he and I were at Harvard at the same time. I was in law school, he was in biology. I didn't even know where the biology building was. And he probably didn't know where the law building was, but we walked around and kind of like looked at all of that. But the purpose of that meeting uh, essentially was, I asked the question, are we maximizing the societal benefit of, the, uh, of these dialogues? And, uh, and the response was, that's an excellent question. And in the world of science, you know, you can have all the meetings in the world and publish all the books in the world, but science um, proves itself um, with rigorous studies, the results of which are published in peer-reviewed journals. So if we want to have lasting impact, we ought to do that. So I said, fine, as the entrepreneur, fine, let's do it. What do we have to do? And Francisco said, I'll do a study in my lab. And Richie said, I'll do a study in my lab. And Francisco said, we need to get more people involved. So we need to have a public meeting. Um, and then we also agreed that we would change the way that we decided the topics for mind and life dialogues, and that we would choose topics that would seed research ideas. Uh, and so the 2000 meeting was the first meeting under that new agenda. Prior to the meeting, in 2000, uh, I went to Dharamsala early, met with Tenzin Chogel, reviewed this whole shift in strategy of mind and life with him. And then he reviewed it with His Holiness. And then I had an audience with His Holiness and re reviewed it with His Holiness and he liked it. And I remember at that point in time, talking with His Holiness about choosing the topics um, and saying that we wanted to choose them, you know, for research. And he said, fine, I don't have to be involved in that. I trust you guys. You choose the topics from now on. Uh, and then he came into the meeting and he challenged the um, scientists to study uh, the um, effects of meditation uh, in their laboratories to see if they were of benefit or harm. And then asked that if they turned out to be beneficial, that um, we find ways to teach them or uh, in a secular environment or a secular setting. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the turning point really for that mind was, and life that- That, that was then the destructive was, emotions meeting, the destructive yeah. emotions meeting. Right, destructive emotions. And that's when, when um, you know, he, after he said that in the, as he opened the meeting, Paul Ekman got really in, uh, interested in in actually doing some research. And that resulted in uh, the research project that was called Cultivating Emotional Balance. And it resulted in the, uh, you know, the teaching project that Alan Wallace and Eve Ekman have today. And after that, this move towards promoting, making more accessible to a greater public, this work was followed up by the 2003 meeting, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the idea was that, uh, well, I mean, the next thing that happened was that um, we had a meeting um, at Richie's lab um, in 2001. And this would have been the spring of 2001, right. uh, May. Uh, and this was going to be His, His Holiness coming to the laboratory uh, for two days, you know, getting a tour of the laboratory, and then we were gonna have a two-day dialogue, which Francisco was scheduled to participate in. And then I, my recollection is that um, I was with His Holiness in California on another event um, that preceded the 2000, the, the Madison meeting. And uh, my recollection again, Amy, is that you called me and mm -hmm. told me that, uh, Francisco was, wasn't going to come to the meeting. He was going to send Antoine and that he was in heavy decline and he was not going to make it. You know, the doctors had basically said for him to just come home. And uh, is that your recollection as well? Absolutely. And I remember also calling you to let you know. Yeah. And then I, I remember, uh, it, again, His Holiness, I met him. I walked with him up to the stage in that meeting and I told him 
about that, you know, about Francisco's bad health. Um, and that, you know, um, and then I remember we had to change the date of the meeting at the last minute, but, but then, um, Again, I remember uh, talking with Cliff and with you. Uh, check me if I got this right, because we were filming the meeting uh, in the in the meeting room for posterity. Uh, it wasn't going to be broadcast or anything like or live streamed or anything. But I asked Cliff whether there was any way to set up a situation so that Francisco could look at the meeting from his bedroom. Uh, do you remember that, Amy? And then, I am. And then, How could I forget it? And, and Francisco, uh, I mean, Cliff worked with you to set all that up. Um, he worked with uh, he worked with Antoine Lutz. Uh, he, my technical ability stopped at being able to turn my computer on, but he worked with Antoine Lutz and uh, Jean Philippe Lachaud, uh, the, the the guys who I called the Labo Boys at the time. I yeah. don't know. Well, Antoine was in and Antoine. Antoine was in right. Madison with me. Right. So uh, anyway, Diego, they put their heads Diego together. Cosmelli, yeah. yeah, yeah, they put their heads together. And what was the scene in, in the bedroom? You had a, a video screen that was that was uh, a, a live feed from the camera in yeah. Madison. We had we had a computer that we put on a piece of computer. wood because Francisco couldn't move, so we put it on a piece. We kind of set up a piece of wood in front of him, and we had a little computer, and then Diego Cosmelli and and Jean Philippe Lachaud set it up so it was a, somehow connected to the webcam right in, uh, and then Madison. and then I, I you know when it, when his holiness's limousine pulled up that morning and he got out of the limousine um you know i it's my practice to get him out of the limousine and escort him into the meeting room you know i held his hand and i told him that we had arranged a live feed so that francisco from his bedroom in paris could watch the meeting. Uh, and uh, I actually have a photograph where, where I was telling him that. <laughs> you know, I had, I had my finger up and uh, one of the Secret Service guys filmed it. But anyway, His Holiness walked into the room. He looked around the room and then he said, which camera? Um, and, you know, you know, which camera was, you know, and Francisco, I mean, uh, Cliff, you know, told him, and he looked directly at the camera um, and, um, you know, said his goodbyes to Francisco. <sighs> Very moving. It was really incredibly moving. Yeah. I was, I was happy to be able to, you know, to do that for Francisco. And, and what, what did it look like from your side, Amy? I can only see it from His Holiness' side because we didn't well, have a we didn't have a a, a video right. of Francisco in the room. Right. So Francisco at the time was was um, uh, I mean it was five four or five days before his death, and he was yeah. very very weak. He could no longer speak. He couldn't. Um, um, and so I was there with actually Francis. Francis, all of four of Francisco's children, um, and um, he, we told him that his holiness was going to speak with him um, through the through the screen, and then the Labo boys were there, so there was quite a bit of commotion. But he was really quite out, you know, and, and alert. But but um, and but when we put the computer in front of him, and and his holiness's face appeared. It was just astounding. There was not a dry eye in the house, as they say. Um, it was, Francisco was in total concentration listening to him and in such a sense of communion with what he was hearing that um, I wrote or said somewhere that it was almost like he was going to dive into the screen and totally alert and, uh, and listening. So. It was um, it was one of the last moments of his life, actually, where he was really totally alert. Um, but um, actually, talking about this, Adam, makes me think of another story from my side, which was when uh, His Holiness, uh, when Francisco 
realized that he couldn't go to the meeting. He actually bought his tickets to go to, I remember he was flying to Chicago and then flying to Madison. And I was like, there's just no way that he's going to be able to do this. But, um, and then he got very, very, very ill and had to go to intensive care to the ICU where he was all hooked up to bottles and this and that. And so um, for a few days. And so I went in one afternoon to visit him and there's Antoine. So he was really weak already. This was about two weeks right. before the meeting. And I, I walk into the, into, the, into the ICU to visit him. And there he is propped up with a, a kind of a table thing set up next to him with Antoine. And he's instructing on Antoine. Um, and as I walked in, he had a very weak voice at the time, but Antoine must have said, was running through Antoine's presentation. And so at some point Antoine said something and as I was walking in, I, I could hear Francisco with a very weak voice, but it was very Francisco voice. No, not that way Antoine, this way. <laughs> it, was, it was a very funny moment because uh, this connection with his holiness and this connection with mind and life and with you and with the whole organization was such that it brought him to life literally when he was, you know, practically gone already so yes i remember well, that what, very well. what was this because i didn't find out that francisco wasn't coming until just a couple of days before the meeting yeah, uh, no it it, it it was clear it was clear he started to prepare antoine to take his place maybe I 10 see. days, 10 I days see. before the meeting yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so between the destructive emotions meeting and, and uh, MIT, there was that, of course, and there was the homage meeting in 2022. There was what meeting? In, 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 there was the homage meeting in uh, 2002. Homage. That was dedicated to Francisco after he died. Oh, in, in, in Darmsala. Yeah. Darmsala. Yeah, yeah. 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 Maybe we can ask you, Adam, a, uh, a more personal question related to your involvement in the, in the work of mind and life. Uh, you, you said, uh, you refer to your investment in these dialogues as a risk venture at the time. And what, what was it that persuaded you to invest in such a venture? Where, where did I say that? Um, in one of our preparation meetings. And, uh, uh, okay. And uh, uh, how did you come to see he, it as a venture, as a skillful mean to shift the public perception of contemporary? Oh, oh so, so what, I'm, what, I'm, what I meant by that was this was when we were you know, shifting the, the uh, expanding the focus of mind and life from the dialogues in Dharamsala. The dialogues in Dharamsala, you know, I, uh, in my mind, in my life, you know, it was a gift phase. I, was, I wasn't getting paid. I, it, was a, it was a hobby for me. I was earning my living doing something else. Uh, and like everyone else who was in the room, I was a volunteer. My job was just, you know, organize everything to get everyone there. Once we decided to go public and to expand the mission into a research mission, um, and in my mind, what got me going in that was, uh, I, th I think I really related the story before, but I, I, I said earlier that their re the, the recommendation of the advisory council was to do research. And then as I started, after that meeting, as I started thinking about what was going to be entailed to do that and to set up a public meeting. I realized it was going to be, um, it was going to take me, uh, I had to give up my day job and actually devote myself full time to this. Um, and that the chance of it succeeding and was, was very, very remote. But more importantly, I didn't really have the personal juice. Uh, since I'm not a scientist, I'm more of a social activist. 
I didn't have a lot of juice just for, you know, spending my life setting up research for research sake. But one of the things that I connected up was His Holiness's uh, observation during the meetings that we in the West were fixated on physical fitness and uh, physical hygiene. And what about mental fitness and mental hygiene? And that kind of stuck in my mind. So I did some research into physical fitness to see what was it that transformed physical fitness in the West from essentially barbell gyms to ubiquity, you know, where everyone's doing it all over. Um, and what I saw was it was the cardiac science. When the cardiologists in the 60s and the 70s, Dean Ornish and his band of renegades, came up with this harebrained scheme that you could treat and impact cardiac disease through lifestyle change and specifically aerobic and physical activity. And that started getting published and started getting popular. That notion got popularized. It stimulated demand for physical, act, physical fitness activity and it spawned the whole industry so that it became ubiquitous. And I looked at that and I said, gee, I wonder if we could follow that example with mental and emotional fitness. And uh, that gave me the personal juice uh, and motivation to, uh, you know, give up my day job and, uh, you know, throw myself, uh, you know, a thousand percent into my new life. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's what I did. And, uh, and, and, you know, personally, it was risky because I needed a, earn a living from my family. And I didn't see a way that I could do that from what I was, you know, what I could afford to get from mine in life. But I decided to give it a go, at least through the, the, the first meeting and then see what happened. And the first meeting was so successful. We went into that meeting uh, uh, virtually bankrupt as an organization. And, and it was so successful uh, with the public talk adjoined and the fundraising around it that um, we came, came out of it with uh, close to a million dollars. And so we were able to, you know, launch um, in earnest, you know, we launched the Summer Research Institute and then at the Summer Research Institute, uh, the research grants, which uh, got named for Francisco. Uh, so does that answer your question? You want me to? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Adam. I mean, you may want to you, you may want to add something to it. No, it's a, it's a, it's an epic story for me, Adam. It's an epic. Story. Yeah, you know, it, it 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 you know, looking back, you know, on my life, and you know, this occurrence, you know, especially at this phase of my life, um, you know, where it's kind of a taking stock phase. I turned eighty this year, and uh, there's a lot of reminiscence going on. Um, in the culture from people in my age group uh, reflecting on, uh, you know, what they've done in life. And it, it's always been kind of a conundrum to me on how someone with my background, um, you know, turned away from uh, other activities that would have made me a lot richer and a lot more uh, renowned uh, to do this. But um, it was just something that, you know, when I, You know, when I speak to His Holiness about it, you know, he he says things like past lives and, you know, personal connections, stuff like that, or, you know, previous in, incarnations. You know, so you think about His Holiness, and I know that he said this to you, Amy, and he said it to Francisco, and he said it to me um, about uh, us, you know, having past life history together and having future life history together. Maybe you can relate what he said to Francisco about yeah. that. Yeah, well, he uh, he said to Francisco, and he said several times publicly after Francisco died that um, that he was the spiritual brother and that he was sure that they would see each other um, yeah. again in future lives. But I do remember, Adam, one of the things that, that, that I remember quite well from was after, during the period after Francisco died, when there were 
lots of questions also about what was going to happen to mind and life. Um, and there wasn't yet an organization really. It was a kind of more or less loosely connected group of more <laughs> or less loosely connected people. And I remember listening to you talk about, that was the first time I heard the term herding cat was yeah. from you. Um, but I also remember um, you said, I'm not a scientist, which you're not, but I remember your learning curve because at that time when Francisco died and even though he'd been very ill, it was kind of a surprise for many people. Oh God. People were, yeah. people were unprepared. I mean, even just now, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, it was hard for people to imagine when we were talking earlier about how many days before the meeting did he cancel, it was, it was kind of a surprise for everyone even the people who were somewhat aware. But yeah. your, your yeah. learning curve was astounding. I have to take this moment out maybe to say that in the sense of um, needing perhaps temporarily to take the voice of all three um, in the secret sauce. And um, you, you had to herd the cats at the same time you had to keep the thing afloat and it was quite, amazing the the speed with which you learn to speak scientifically and accurately scientifically about the whole project and and that curve was always stunned me <laughs> because uh you'd understood sub science before but you under the pressure that you were under to keep it going after francisco dies i don't know how much you remember about that period you might have repressed it but um but it was quite well, striking and very, very, I was very much in admiration. Well, thank you for that. One, yeah, a couple of things that I, that I remember. Um, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the benchmark for the successful liver transplant, I believe was 30 months. Was that right? If he could, if the liver could stay cancer free for 30 months, that was a milestone that indicated that, um, you know, he could go on for, you know, another phase of his life. And he was doing really well for almost 30 months. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that the way you remember? Mm -hmm. Not really. He, okay. he, I think at the time they weren't very clear about benchmarks because there weren't that many liver transplants being done. But his his he was operated on in June, and actually his new liver, the graft, you know, the grafted liver, was they found cancer in it the following September. So four months later, and that was when we knew that um, that this wasn't looking good. So, so that means that means when he came to Cambridge in in that October, he already knew that he already the knew new, the new liver was was bad. Yes, or, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So and I had he that died, wrong. He died two years, three actually, um, three years later. So, but he, you know, he he was he was um, very ill most of the time between the transplant and his. Yeah, I, I know that, that there was, uh, when we would talk, a lot of it had to do with the cycle of the drugs. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the, but it was like the first week after the drugs went in, he was really, really out of it. And then he recovered and I think. I th exactly. I, th I think it was on a three week cycle. And so. Yeah we scheduled our meetings for the third week before he went in again right for those drugs exactly exactly god yeah god that, that must have been so harrowing for you i mean god having to live through all of this with him yeah well he he mm. he um as you saw because you know you you i mean he didn't tell everyone details about what he was going through his his mind was always completely sharp and um, he didn't uh, he didn't let himself get trapped in in anxiety about it most of the time so yeah 
but I think there's some, Gabor, are there some questions before? We, before yes, we actually, move? actually, we, we, we had another bigger question to ask from Adam, but that is very much uh, related to what we are reading uh -huh. in the chat already. So instead of us asking that question from you, Adam, I'm, I turn to Elaine Atio, who posted a question uh, uh, on the chat, and also Katrin kodman Schuler, who asks a similar question. So Elaine and uh, Katrin, you may share your questions together, and then uh, this was uh, primarily what we were thinking about too. So Elaine. Yes, thank you so much, Gabor. Adam, I've been wanting to listen to you since I attended the first Mind and Life Institute dialogue back in Washington, DC. You were not there, but that was the first encounter I had uh, in 2009 on reimagining education for the 21st century citizen. And then in Zurich, the year after that on compassionate economics, and then following that, the Belgium dialogue in 2016, before I then got involved in Mind and Life Europe. So I come from a practitioner standpoint. So this is just such an honor to get the chance to listen to your stories and get to ask you personally, having lived through this entire arc, uh, what do you feel will be your personal legacy as the third of these pillars? I have had the benefit of hearing so much from the contemplatives and also of, from the researchers. And I've always longed um, being a practitioner myself and being entrepreneur, you know, driven by very much the same motivation to bring this to, to, to a world that could benefit so much from these tools. I'd love to hear how it looks like from, from you. What's your personal aspiration and from a practical standpoint, because I think that practical aspects are so important. What are some promising avenues that you would like to sow as seeds for us to, to explore? Uh, one of the things also was that I was part of the Cultivating Emotional Balance so the whole part is also just so, so fantastic. I was there um, listening to even um, Alan talk. So there's all this amazing potential, but I would be keen to know uh, what your thoughts are on that. So what you're asking me is what, what I think. I've, I've always the, felt the, yeah I've always felt the entrepreneurial sort of aspect tr translation aspect perhaps even though it's dilution and pro pro propagation aspect you know because I suppose in my day-to-day -day work um, there's such a big gulf between so much of the goodness that I personally am privileged to be part of within mine and life and I'm just wondering what your take was on that okay in what ways can we yeah. accelerate that change and, and what what's holding us back uh, what are your, what does your intuition say? What does your experience say? Do you have any advice for us? Well, yeah, uh, I, I don't know that I have any advice, but here's my observation. One of, from my point of view, one of the biggest tragedies um, that befell this movement, if you will, uh, is the, again, from my perspective, what we were trying to do was to spawn a robust mental and emotional fitness industry to parallel physical fitness. But from my point of view, unfortunately, it has gotten labeled as mindfulness. And the reason for that was, um, Fortuitously, or when we started doing the research, when the scientists started doing the research, they needed a protocol to study. And the only product, the, the most available protocol that was standardized was the MBSR program. So a lot of the a lot of the research then and a lot of the research now is focused on you know, mindfulness and uh, originally MBSR and stuff. And so then when the industry started getting going, you know, John Kabat-Zinn is out there, you know, as a very charismatic, you know, uh, megaphone and it got labeled mindfulness and it, and the practic and the practicality, the, the value proposition for people got translated into coping mechanism. So 
from from our point of view, and I, I'm I'm presumptuous now. We're looking at a culture here, you know, a Western culture that is off the boards insane. You know, it's an insane asylum, you know, where we're bathed in oceans of messaging every day to sell stuff. And that triggers our addictions. You know, the, the whole messaging thing is to trigger addictions so that you'll go out and buy something, which is, a, you know, an absolutely insane way to set up a culture in terms of planetary development. You know, we're killing ourselves. So unfortunately, what's happened is the mindfulness movement plugs into that to try and give people a tool to, be, to better maintain themselves in the insane culture. And nowhere along this line is the insanity of the culture being addressed uh, on a mass scale. And what happens when people focus on pal palliative relief from suffering you know, because of, of stress and stuff like that, is that the real work of contemplative practice gets ignored, which is ego management, you know, and, and getting your ego into a place where you can listen to, you know, what's beyond it. And that's the tragedy of where we are today with with the movement so my my response would be uh any kind of ways to um re you know to get the message out or to you know to uh, for people to use the the practices for their real purpose rather than just as a palliative and i'm not sure how you do that um uh, there may be research studies that could be done to actually measure um, uh, you know reduction of of, of ego I, I you know I don't know how you how you do that but um, you know that would be up to the scientists but 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 you know that's really what contemplative work is designed to do um, and that's the piece that's not really getting enough focus at this point in time, in my view. Does that answer your question? Thank you. It does. Thank you, Adam. So you are referring to the cultural social context uh, to be addressed, as well as the personal dimension. And that might also relate to Katrin's uh, question. If you if you want to address this this question, the same question, Katrin, maybe from another from another angle. Please. Happy to, happy yeah. to, and hello, Adam. So hey, good it's good to see you, you again. Where, 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 where are you where are you speaking from? I'm in San Francisco. Oh wow, you're one of the. Uh, well, you're like me. It's daytime, so. It is def. It's it's morning, and it's a gorgeous blue sky, and I see the bay out there, and it's it's just lovely. So I have been working on that area, but it's so hard. And you and I talked about it years ago. What I've, what I've been doing is trying to work with the people, and there are some who are looking at the connection of creating a healthy society, you know, sort of the path from healthy individual to healthy organizations to healthy society. And that, so... Really, uh, I'm wondering, I, I don't see, although Gabor, we chatted a little privately that you're saying Mind and Life US is going in that direction. I, I don't see it so much. I see people looking at the role of inclusion of all different people, I, and then uh, they go out to species in, in the notion of health. So there is discussion of that, but it's it's a minor thread in this dominant one. And of course, you all know, I, I unfortunately missed Richie's, but I know about the four-pronged approach they're taking. I'm wondering, Adam, 
It makes me nostalgic going back to thinking of the 70s and the 80s and what we were trying to do, that it seems like in many ways everything was so successful because there's so much focus on awareness, but it did, it got so individual rather than global. I'm what, Any other comments that you have, any hunches or insights from your entrepreneurial being about what either or both Mind and Life Europe and US and the rest of us might do at this odd juncture? Well, I mean, I think the focus on the individual is necessary and correct because societies are made up of individuals. And if you don't have enough healthy human beings in the society, then you're not going to, you know, it's got to be a bottom up transformation of society. You're not going to get a top down transformation. I mean, it helps. It, it really, really helps if you have uh, wise leaders, you know, who can message properly. But, you know, from my point of view right now, you know, all of the leadership has been taken over by, you know, the dominant uh, values, which is, um, you know, short term material gain. I mean, we've got a culture that has elevated to its number one value. Uh, the maximization of short-term material gain. And uh, that's what everything, that's what governs everything. Uh, you know, these, uh, you know, all of the corporations are run by oligarchs. You know, the oligarchs run the governments and, the, and they're all into uh, maximizing, uh, you know, their quarterly profits, uh, which feeds into, you know, their compensation systems. Um, and so you've got, you know, this huge megaphone. I mean, just look at look at the futility and the lack of traction that Tristan Harris and his crowd, is it Tristan Harris? You know, the 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 social dilemma, um, you know, where they're they're screaming about the ill uh the negative impacts of uh of the social media uh conglomerates on um you know, societal health. Um, are you are you following what I'm saying? I haven't been following that closely. So, but but you know you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know you know so so here they hear these people from Silicon Valley who are looking at the business models of um, you know the Facebooks of the world, and they're saying you know this is killing our culture, and we have to do something about it, and. To my way of thinking, they're getting zero traction. I mean, you know, people, you know, uh, you know, Twitter tries to do something right, and you know, Elon Musk comes along and buys a damn thing. You know, it's going to be his megaphone. You've got Rupert Murdoch and his megaphone. You know, Mark Zuckerberg and his megaphone, and now you'll have Elon Musk and his megaphone. And we got to try and compete with that for messaging. You know, when they've got all of the research that's been done. Um, so anyway, I, I, I don't have an easy answer for you right now. What I've been doing personally to try and, uh, you know, figure this out is, um, you know, analyzing, you know, how, how do you get the kind of cultural change that we actually need? And to my way of thinking, we're not going to get that kind of change. Uh, and, and, and I focus it on problems. You know, the problem is climate change and inequality. And we're not going to get the change that we need so long as the oligarch class of the world is pushing the old values and resisting solutions to climate change and to inequality. So... Is there any way to get leverage in that class? And the project that I'm working on now is focused on the inheritors. You know, the oligarch, the patriarch oligarchs, the Rupert Murdochs of the world, you're not going to change. Their neuroplasticity is baked in to such an extent that, you know, but 
the inheritors, you know, the children and the grandchildren and the great grandchildren are going to inherit those empires. And there's already a massive intergenerational squabble in those families between the generations. So if you could somehow um, have influence uh, with the inheritor generation and reposition those family offices and those oligarchic empires toward positive so social change and positive climate change and equality, um, then you can start getting some leverage. But I don't see anyone, uh, I mean, I'm working with a couple of people in those families, but it's even hard to get their attention. So another prong, I think, goes back to one of the people you mentioned, Roshi Joan Halifax, who is trying to do that in a different way than what you're describing. And perhaps there's ways of connecting those two or amplifying what she's doing through the mind and life groups with her chaplaincy training and all the extensive programming she's been doing online. It's... I think very impressive work. Yeah, it's it's impressive for the uh, look. You know, the bottom line is that there have been very very impressive people for decades. Uh, I, I think Deepak Chopra had a you know convened a gathering of a number of years ago among you know the literati of the consciousness teaching movement. You know, and to you know expose the point that with all of the work that everyone has been doing, it's not having any effect culturally. I mean, look at the physical fitness industry. It's, you know, it, it's, it's ubiquitous all over. And yet physical health is in the worst state that it's ever been. You know, so, so what we're up against, I think, is... No one is addressing successfully or even with any kind of voice the second most powerful addiction that everyone faces. The first addiction that we all face and we're all locked in and really is the addiction to a separate self. You know, that's the fundamental foundation of all suffering is that we think that we are separate selves and those of us that are involved in the contemplative world are trying to you know do something about that individually the second most important or powerful addiction is the addiction to more and we all have that even if it's not money you know it's more status it's more beauty it's you know more fun and where in the culture is anyone addressing that directly? Just the addiction to more. Why is it so hard and impossible for people to realize that they have enough? Even, you know, I mean, look at the oligarchs. You know, I mean, isn't it enough that you have billions and billions of dollars? So, so you know, this is this is where, I mean, you know, if, if we're going to address energy at this point in time, we've got to address, you know, the root addictions and come up with strategies to start, you know, uh, uh, creating interventions that will have an impact there. And, you know, I'm not familiar with, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, that, that Joan's work in chaplaincy is great, you know, and the people that are coming out of that are, you know, are great, you know, but, but it's, it's like, you know, grains of sand, you know, in this ocean of, uh, you know, of, of messaging that is bombarding people, um, you know, constantly, you know, and, um, you know, how do you, how, you know, how do you, how do you deal with that? You know, um, it's not an even playing field. And so, and so, so more than ever, 
the inquiry has to be um, looking for the leverage points, you know, which is which is what I I do as an entrepreneur. You know, how can I apply a little bit of energy, you know, for maximum impact? Um, thank, thank you, Catherine, for the great question, and thanks, Adam, for for your um, pondering and your 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 idea how to go forward. We have got some similar questions in the chat. I would just probably turn to Peter Koenig, uh, asking the last question because uh, what time is uh, limited, and we don't want to exhaust you with too many more quest too many more questions. So, Peter, uh, just a short reflection and maybe a question you wanted to. Well, thank you, thank you, Gabor, and thank you very much, Adam, for all that you have done in the past and for speaking right now um, actually from my heart and soul I'm totally 100% with you and I'm sitting 300 meters away from the uh, the institute of Carl Gustav Jung and I actually posed myself the same question you just asked in 1983 and uh, worked for seven years to research an answer and have a system to actually be able to um, help people uh, in this particular, with an answer to this particular thing. I know it's a bit crazy to suggest that one has answers, but there are many, many people since 1991 that have been working with my system, which was so far advanced, a bit like Francisco's, I'd like to say, that it was very difficult to diffuse, but it's becoming starting to become popular now. And so my question to you, from what you've just said is, you know, money is not life, but it's a wonderful entry point. The relationship to money is a wonderful pretext to look at everything else that you're doing in life. And so my question for you and actually for Mind of Life is could the transformation to the relationship to money, to profit and to capitalism be really the next key agenda item for mind and life. And I'd like to know what you think about that, to help people in their relationship to money individually, but of course, also collectively. What, what do you think? Wouldn't that be a great agenda item for mind and life for the next steps? I'd love to hear your answer. Well, I hear what you're saying. It's a great question. Um, you know, what comes up for me is that most relationships, most people's relationships to money are um, you know, couched within their relationship to how they feel about more. You know, um, and and so addressing uh, the addiction to more, I think, is is beneath that. Uh, you know, it, it it goes deeper. Um, so that's that's one point. The other point is that when you, for the vast majority of the people on the planet, you know, they're living below the level, I mean, their, their relationship with money is survival. And, you know, what the data shows, I think, is that once you, in, in a Western culture, once you get above, you know, let's say 100 grand, then more money doesn't really improve your lifestyle and, you know, your uh, abilities. But beneath that, um, it actually does mean a lot. So you're going to have to parse that message to, um, you know, to focus on different people's relation, you know, different class people's relationship for money. You know, if you're, if you're below a hundred grand, you know, you got to think about money because, you know, without money, your kids don't have an education and, you know, you, you don't have enough food, let's say you don't have housing. If you, you know, and then if you're at the billionaire class, you know, it's just like off the charts stupid. I mean, you know, they're not talking about money. They're just in the billionaire sweepstakes. You know, they just want more status. 
you know, the money doesn't mean anything. Um, so I, I hear what you're, where you're going, but I think it has to be nuanced um, depending on, you know, what audience you're really trying to talk to. Whereas, you know, focusing on the addiction to more um, encompasses everyone, you know, because one of the things that I noticed in mind and life was that with the academics, um, you know, they, they would, um, you know, uh, criticize the business people because of their addiction to money or their, you know, their greediness, but they were just as greedy, you know, but their greed was, uh, you know, for words or for status. So it's really, uh, you know, the addiction to more that I think is, is, the, is the fundamental thing that we really should be focusing on. Um, thank you very much, Adam. And thank you, Peter. I, I think we will continue the discussion around this topic because it's an absolutely vital one. And we may invite you, Adam, to come back to one of our dialogues in the near future discussing. Sure, I'm happy to. Subject in question. And uh, I'm really sorry that we don't have uh, more time to raise uh, two remaining questions that were shared in the chat. It was absolutely fantastic to, to hear your very precise, very detailed and individual uh, stories uh, from the early and last days and contemporary days of mind and life. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, was, it, was, it was more than a resource of knowledge. It was uh, personal. It was uh, li lively. It was uh, bringing all those days back to us. And thank you so much. And Amy, you may want to share a few few reflections on words before I conclude the meeting with our upcoming events. Yeah, well, I could, I'd just like to thank you again, Adam, and, and everyone who's here um, for reminding us that a big story is made out of a lot of smaller stories that come together and, and evolve and make of mind and life a dynamical system that, that uh, is changing and moving into the future now. So thank you for thinking about so carefully about this history and and the present and the future with us adam it's wonderful thank you so much it's been an honor for me to be be here and thank you all for participating and listening to to adam's sharing uh, leslie is doing this so it's a it's a huge big uh, thank you thank you adam and uh, we will have you back i, I can promise um, um now I would like to ask uh, my colleague Charlotte to share what's uh, coming. I will just uh, give you a short uh, description. So we will have uh, some upcoming events. Uh, I would say more upcoming events, but I'm now afraid of using this term, this word, wanting more. Maybe wanting more of not wanting more, but this is, uh, this is interesting. So let's, let's, let's think about it. So we will have an Emily Friends and CC talk with... Uh, Anna Bornstein, the uh, a Swedish journalist, uh, talking about bringing calm to kids, the dream of the good project in Sweden. Uh, CC means the Community of Contemplative Education. That's uh, uh, upcoming on May May, 4th, May uh, 18th. So there is a little mistake uh, with the date there. And then we will have Barry Curzon, a Mind Matters talk, no center, no edge, letting go of a fixed identity. So maybe that will relate to also letting go of more because uh, uh, Adam mentioned the identity as the first addiction and uh, we will see whether we can get into letting go of the second addiction too. Then we will have a bigger event. Please uh, please sign up to this one. The Varela International Symposium 2022 organized, co-organized with the Upaya Institute and Zen Center, uh, Roshi John Halifax, who was mentioned uh, a lot today, laying down a path in walking, mind in life, interdependence and an action with great speakers coming from uh, both United States and Europe. And then we will have another Francisco and Friends event uh, in the series uh, after Adam's talk. The next next speaker will be Sergio Nayan Schwanda, uh, uh, another great uh, uh, student, uh, disciple of Francisco's from uh, France, uh, we are so much looking forward to having him as well in the series. So thank you all. Thank you for participating and thank you in advance for attending these upcoming events. And uh, we are going to continue the discussions uh, about everything we 
heard from Adam today. So once again, thanks you, Adam. And thanks, Genevieve, for the French translation. And thank you, Amy, for the dialogue with, with Adam and all the memories you shared together.